Okay, uh, so welcome to the online launch uh, of the study of social inclusion, digitalization and young people. Uh, we'll still be waiting uh, for the people to join. You can, while we are getting ready, you can also use the chat function to introduce yourself. Uh, you can uh, write to panelists and you can also write to panelists and all attendees. And uh, also to inform everybody that uh, this uh, video will be recorded and uh, is also going live on the Facebook account of the partnership between the European Commission and the Council of Europe in the field of youth. Okay, uh, so we have uh, some of our panelists uh, joining in the chat, but also some of the participants. While we are getting ready, uh, I will just uh, share the screen uh, of the study uh, to basically quickly introduce uh, the study on social inclusion, digitalization and young people. Uh, so this is uh, one of the products uh, that uh, stemmed uh, basically from the 2018 symposium on the same topic. And last year, the partnership uh, between the European Commission and the Council of Europe in the field of youth, together with uh, some of the researchers from the pool of European youth researchers and other experts, worked on uh, producing the study and also youth knowledge book on the same topic. Uh, as uh, some of you might know, the launch of the study was planned uh, this year uh, and this spring, uh, but now we are doing the online launch. And uh, we have with us uh, today uh, all the authors of the study. Um, so I will quickly introduce uh, all of them. Uh, so Adina Sherban, uh, Veronika Stefan, Dan Moxon and Dunja Potocnik and myself. Uh, and today, uh, the, uh, Veronica and Adina are going to do a presentation of, uh, of the final results. And then in, Dan and Dunya will also be there to join uh, to answer some of your questions, but and then also to add on some of the findings of the study. Uh, the webinar will last one hour, and we would like to ask you during this time to please add all your questions and comments either in the Zoom uh, webinar chat. Uh, or in the Q&A option of uh, the Zoom. Uh, as you might have noticed, uh, everybody is muted at the moment, uh, but uh, you can use then the option to, to write uh, your questions. Okay. Uh, for those of you who are, on, who are watching us on uh, Facebook Live, uh, you can also type your comments uh, or questions uh, in the Facebook. Uh, and we will be taking all the questions at the end of the, of the webinar after the presentation. Uh, and then we can also have some interaction. Okay, uh, so to start off with, uh, basically uh, the study has explored uh, some of the concepts and questions related to social inclusion, digitalization uh, and young people, what these concepts are, uh, but then also discussing uh, what are some of the national policies and European policies in place. And uh, also uh, we have uh, spoken about uh, what are the opportunities uh, and risks of digitalization for young people and for social inclusion. And uh, some of the main findings of the study uh, came from the questionnaires which looked at the tools and platforms available for young people. Uh, and uh, also for youth workers and educators uh, to see what are some of the available tools uh, that are there, uh, what are the tools that youth workers and young people are using uh, when it comes to social inclusion. Uh, so basically to start off with, uh, we wanted to ask you the question uh, with uh, the Mentimeter. Uh, so what you need to do is basically go to menti.com and type in the code 19 70 32. So 19 70 32. 
And you will have a question, uh, which we will uh, try to show as we go ahead. And the questions are basically, does digitalization facilitate social inclusion? And uh, you will have uh, four answers to choose from. Okay. So you can go on Menti uh, and we will show some of the results towards the end of the screen, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, so now I would like to give floor uh, to Adina and Veronica uh, to basically introduce the study and take you through some of the findings uh, before we go to the questions. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Adina Sherban, and uh, thank you for joining this uh, webinar. Uh, I hope that you're all uh, safe and enjoy the uh, opportunities that the digital world uh, offers to us when the offline world is not uh, that fun anymore, but challenging enough. Um, as Anna was saying, it, it's been an amazing learning journey, and I'm saying that it's been an amazing learning journey because I've just introduced myself a bit. Um, I'm a grassroots youth worker working with young people from the rural areas. I'm also a youth researcher, part of the pool of European youth researchers, and I've been also involved with policy making, being a former member of the Advisory Council on Youth and being quite close to different political and non-political processes. So moving a bit around the magic triangle when it comes to youth. So uh, this opportunity to work with the steering group on the study took me again to this triangle and offered me the opportunity to look at the angles and to see what the opportunities and also the challenges are. Um, well, I think that looking at this study, we should also have a disclaimer in our mind. And that would be that we worked on the study before the all the crisis with COVID started. So also looking now at the question that you'd have to answer in Mentimeter, that was at that time, uh, part of the reality that we could imagine, but now the reality that you are working on might be different. I'm also now thinking of the grassroots youth workers who are quite challenged in offering still learning opportunities to young people that they work with. So that's why I'm, I'm asking you to look at the study, looking at the reality we had a couple of months ago, and somehow maybe it would be a good starting point to think of what this crisis brought us and maybe to, yeah, why not? Maybe the partnership would also have something in the plan to go on with the study and to see what's changed during these months. But yeah, going back to, to what we have at the moment, um, I, I have a short presentation that I would like to share with you. Okay. Uh, so yeah, why, why this study and why thinking that social inclusion and digitalization should look, be looked at together? Where going back to youth interests and needs, we all tend to think that all young people are online. And of course you would say, no, 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 all young people are online. Well, we know that. And, but we also wanted to see if there are opportunities that are being offered to those young people who might have face challenges in being online and also if they're online, what's happening there in terms of social inclusion. Uh, there are plenty of groups of young people who either don't have the opportunity to get online, thinking now of, the, of missing the infrastructure or not having the equipment, or the fact that at times we use a language that it's not either youth-friendly or they cannot understand it. So due to different reasons, they might not have the access to this digital world. And this is why we wanted to, to see a bit the reality through this study. Um, and that's why, as Lana was saying, we tried to look at a bit at the concepts and understandings of social inclusion and exclusion, uh, also to the digital knowledge and the opportunities. So what's there online and should be appealing or challenging to young people? And also to look at the existing legal frameworks. Well, either you like it or not, that's the thing. We have also to look at those wonderful documents that are there. Uh, and we wanted to, to explore the way that these opportunities are being used and to see if this digital world really impacts somehow the inclusion of young people. 
um, where we are used to look at social inclusion and to think all to all the safety nets. Yeah, so to think of employment, to think of education, of family, so all the safety nets that would support a young person into fulfilling its personal or professional development. But then do young people with fear opportunities have all these safety nets? And we would say, well, but the digital world may, may make things easier to handle. Is that still a question? Do they make things easier to handle? Uh, and also with digitalization, well, it made uh, our life easier when it comes also thinking to this webinar that we have this great opportunity to be here together to speak of the study and to everything that's happening in the online world. But does it really impact social inclusion of young people with fear opportunities? That's why we put in place a, a methodology where we used um, uh, two main uh, instruments of data collection. That was the DES review. I was mentioning before about the wonderful uh, documents that we have there. So policy documents, literature review, everything that we could find available. And also an online questionnaire that was circulated. And here we are extremely grateful to EKIP, so to the European Knowledge Center on uh, Youth Policy, because the correspondents did answer to our questions. And also what was also important, it, it was the fact that it was circulated to practitioners, so that was youth educators, youth workers, NGOs having expertise. So we, we tried to collect all these practices that Veronica would present later using this magical triangle still. And we tried to, as I was mentioning earlier, to see where's the youth policy at the moment, focusing on social inclusion and digitalization to present practices. And again, you'll say, well, but there were not uh, practices from the country I come from. Well, maybe we didn't have answers on that. So that's why I would say that it's an open repository because we could also update it. And also to look at the risks of and opportunities. It would be great if the digital world would come all, only with opportunities, but there's a wide range of risks that we should be aware of. With social inclusion, I would say that uh, it was an easier mission because there's plenty of policies that were drafted, there were plenty of practices, and we are used somehow to, to work with social inclusion in practice. So we write projects. We tend to believe that we are able to work with different groups of young people with fear opportunities and keeping our mind that they might face more or one, than one of those obstacles. So we thought that it was easier to do that. Uh, with digitalization, again, everyone when speaking of digitalization would jump to thinking of digital natives. So if you are born 90s, 20, then you could definitely have the competencies to go online to do things. But is it real or it's only a wonderful theory that we, we just jump immediately to work with? And where's the gap between digital natives and immigrants? So how does the this digital world look like when it comes to as well opportunities for young people youth workers and why not for the youth policy field uh, then also i was mentioning earlier what do young people do online because it, yeah we are now holding this webinar when school is happening online when education yeah either if parents uh, or teachers or children, people's young people liked it or not, it's happening online. So where young people used to use all these learning opportunities before in the online world or is just happening now? Because from the data that was available, we saw that some of them uh, were mainly using it to have fun online, but then less for these learning opportunities that they were offered. Uh, and Dan uh, did a wonderful job in helping and collecting all this information during the sixth cycle of the structured dialogue, uh, where they were looking also at the, the uh, young people to interact and use these learning opportunities online, uh, looking as well at the minority groups. And compared to the majority groups, again, it was less chances to go online and to benefit of all these opportunities that adults or uh, institutions would put in place for young people. And yeah, moving now to what we as youth workers are doing at the moment. Uh, the conclusions on digital youth work of the last year were saying that we as youth workers should uh, definitely develop our skills and to be able to 
uh, help young people um, still fulfill their personal and uh, personal and professional potential in this online world. But that would require also in a great learning process for youth workers as well. And there's always the question, is this online and smart youth work that we are doing coming up with the same outcomes as the traditional way of doing youth work, of providing youth work services? Uh, and if we are doing this digital youth work, are we able to outreach to those young people with fewer opportunities, young people from different minorities groups? That's an open question we have at the moment, and it would be great if you could share good practices that you, you've met, that you came across, or good practices, or practices, whatever, not, not calling them good practices, but practices that you have in your organization in terms of digital youth work, and you could share with your peers as well. Uh, going now to the relevant policies, so well, we looked at the EU policy and also the Council of Europe uh, policy, and it was obvious that what comes for young uh, people, it's there within the wide range of uh, European policies. So uh, it was a, a great approach on competencies and on the fact that all citizens need uh, competencies to deal with the digital world. But then where are young people in this process? So it's a very general, I would say, framework uh, that yeah, did offer young people some opportunities to develop some competencies, but not that much in terms of linking digitalization and social inclusion. Um, Council of Europe yeah, did some steps and the youth partnership has a great amount of resources that uh, they produced and a lot of great outcomes uh, through the symposia and through the events that were run so far but you would see also in in the study that uh, thinking of the two concepts together is still at the beginning also in the policy field in terms of national policies we've got 38 answers from 23 countries and uh, geographically speaking it was a very good coverage um, and we also got answers from state and not state actors so it was great to see that youth NGOs and youth networks did share their practices as well um, through this uh, survey we wanted to see what's happening there for young people and thinking yes, that young people should be involved in the process as well, but there are still some steps to be done in, in that uh, sense. Um, it was a lot of examples that were shared mainly related to the impact of digitalization in formal education. So most of the states did some steps into that uh, to support a bit the infrastructure development. And yeah, that's uh, an emergent need these days. Uh, schools got access to internet and some of the public digital services were there as well. So a lot of on formal education and on some public uh, services. And you can imagine that these were mostly the answers that the state actors provided us with. In terms of examples, well, I only have here some countries, so some, some answers that we collected, but if you'd go back to the study in the annexes, you'd find the, the full answers in different countries, different topics. So you could always go there and, and check if uh, someone from your country answered to that. Um, yeah, so for example, in Albania and in Estonia, there are some policies in addressing digitalization in, in line with inclusion and online safety. So some steps that were done so far, uh, Croatia and Germany, there were uh, mainly answers related to linking somehow um, this part with developing competencies in the digital world to working with young people, but not necessarily with young people who would come from different minority groups. Uh, and in other countries where the new national youth strategies or updated ones would have a chapter on digitalization and young people, but not really highlighting social inclusion on that. Um, also, there are, there are tools that might be youth friendly and we found them being youth friendly uh, through the analysis that we put in place uh, so in estonia there's a tool that monitors young people at risk and provides some opportunity for early intervention uh, as in greece we also found out some participation platforms for young people but again it's also the question if 
young people that we are mainly interested into, so young people with fear opportunities, if they have access to those platforms or how are they using those platforms. Uh, also, there's some monitoring related to the process of digitalization in Austria, and we're still looking forward to see um, if this monitoring instrument would bring us more information when it comes to linking the two concepts. Um, yeah, there's still the open question that I was mentioning before. Would this change somehow youth work and youth work services? And particularly thinking of those youth services that would help us outreach more young people with fewer opportunities so those young people who face different obstacles when it comes to their social inclusion. It was, that was the, um, I tried to make it brief. <laughs> um, and I would kindly ask also my colleagues if they would still have some important comments that they would like to ask. Great, thank you so much, Adina. I see that we have some questions uh, from uh, from some of the attendees, uh, but we will take the questions uh, at a later stage. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know if uh, Dan and Dunya would like to uh, add anything. Uh, Dan, I think uh, you had some comments. Yeah, I think just to really emphasize that this, the point that uh, Adina opened with that this happened before COVID. Um, so at the time when we started this process, there was, really a feeling that from a lot of the youth sector that, that digital tools were always automatically inclusive and always reached more people. And I think standing here several months later, there's a lot more realization that that's not the case. Um, so, I, you know, it really can't be emphasized enough how much um, things may well evolve rapidly over the next few months. Thank you, Dan. Uh, yes, this is a, a very important point that we raised also when preparing for this webinar, that uh, the results of the study, which now seems to be more relevant uh, than it was even at the time when we started uh, in April last year, uh, basically that there have been uh, many changes uh, taking place uh, within, our, within our context. Uh, and this also has impacted on the way uh, young people use digital tools and the way others uh, as well uh, use digital tools and opportunities of digitalization, but also the questions uh, regarding the, the gaps uh, and inequalities uh, that this uh, actually has also raised. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Then we go, go on uh, to look into the practices uh, and I give a floor uh, now to Veronica. Hi there. Um, so I'm Veronica uh, and together with Adina, Dan, Dunia and with the supervision of Lana, uh, we have managed to put together this study. Well, from my perspective, and that's very a very brief introduction from my side, I was happy to be part of this process from the very beginning when we first had the symposium connecting the dots and then the steering group and now today. Uh, and of course, I do share the opinion of my colleagues that this is uh, a beginning somehow, uh, considering the times and uh, the context we are living in, but digital was on the agenda before as well. So the study came quite naturally, looking to what existed, what happens uh, from the EU to the member states, both in the EU and in the Council of Europe context. And the fact that the Estonian presidency at that time uh, to the EU Council put uh, the focus on digital youth work was probably one of the biggest advancements uh, in terms of policy recognition, but also in terms of uh, generalizing some practices and many, many exchanges have happened. Many Erasmus Plus projects have been written. Um, so just uh, to start, as uh, time is precious <laughs> uh, here in the, in the online world particularly, I guess, uh, let's see. From my side, uh, I will start um, with, let's say, it's kind of common or not to think. Digitalization will change youth work, they said, or so they said. And here is the question, did it change or not? And that would be for you to, to answer. So in addition to, to Lana's uh, Menti, I will put another one to you. So if you go to Menti, you'll find the code 316815. 
and then you'll have the opportunity to to grade, let's say, or to make your options. Did it change or not based on your experience? So it's not about what we are going to tell you. It's not about the books. It's not about anything. It's just how you have experienced it or how you understand. You can agree with all of them or disagree with all of them. That will still be fine. So I hope you can uh, you can see this Manti. And while I'm going to go through my presentation in key points, you can keep uh, having a look at it. Uh, okay, so going back to the um, to the key presentation. In terms of practices, what the study looked at? Well, we looked at two main dimensions from the practices perspective, in addition to the policy one. One is related to digital tools and online platforms, and the second one is related to digital education, basically talking about the programs and opportunities that are out there and that we have learned about. Um, at all times, we have looked through the lenses of both young people and youth workers or other practitioners. It is important to say that even if I'm going to refer, and most of the times through the study we refer to youth workers, actually we are dealing with educators and practitioners in the wider sense. So it's not just the classic youth work, also because youth work doesn't have one uh, understanding in all the member states in the EU or the Council of Europe. That is important to know. When looking at the platforms, well, we cannot look at the national context without looking at what is out there. And probably um, these platforms will be the ones that we are most familiar with, especially nowadays, especially in, uh, in the context um, of the pandemic. And just uh, briefly, we have uh, three types of uh, platforms that are mostly popular. And one of those we are using right now, virtual meeting room software such as Skype, Zoom, WebEx, Discord. And I underline that because in youth work, uh, Discord is a platform for gamers. So basically, young people are already there using these kind of platforms in, uh, in itself. It means that you can easily outreach to them. Uh, messaging applications, as we are all aware of. So these are just some examples. The variety really depends on the different contexts. Uh, educational platforms, they're also of great support, as it seems, because not all countries have their own national platforms. These one come in handy in these times as well. Coursera, Khan Academy, Scratch or Kahoot. Some of them provide content uh, that you can just access regardless that you are a young person or a grown up. Uh, and some others enable um, creativity and knowledge. Scratch is a platform for um, advanced digital skills in a way, but also uh, initializing, let's say, or introducing children and young people to coding and programming. Kahoot is a very important tool for youth workers that they can use to tailor their content and to pay more engagement content. So I think all these platforms are important to, to remember because they exist. Most of them have uh, either free features or are completely free, so using them is always useful. And the study managed to map them uh, a little bit at least. Uh, in terms of the European level, we have mapped some platforms that are there and that provide either more resources or provide tools and content by themselves. On the one hand, we have the online repositories. Um, it is worth to say that they have been created through Erasmus Plus projects. So Erasmus brings again uh, an important added value in understanding and developing knowledge and content for youth work. The G Youth Portal is one, ICT for Youth Work is another one. There you can find more information about different online tools and platforms that are available, different uh, projects and practices that have been implemented. The European Youth Portal, probably for most of you, it's quite um, a common uh, tool that can be accessed, a EU interinstitutional platform, SALTO Youth Platform. Uh, and then I highlight this particular two. Well, we are at the webinar hosted by the Youth Partnership uh, and Youth Policy Essentials is the first MOOC uh, that focused on this topic. And in case you didn't have the time to take it, uh, you can write it uh, down and uh, have a look later. Youth Work Portfolio, uh, for those that are um, seniors, if I can say so in the youth work sector, they might be familiar with this tool that was created by the Council of Europe in 2006. 
but uh, it has been upgraded to the online version and can be used by youth workers to, um, to use it for self-assessment, to, to keep track and uh, create the learning objectives for themselves as well. So this is again, a very generic uh, overview on the European platforms that exist at this point. Moving on, we looked a little bit at what word practices, as mentioned before, across the uh, member states. So what did we find? We find platforms that are addressed to young people, youth workers, or somehow that are created by institutions and address multiple stakeholders. Now, my presentation highlights the mainly part. So they are mainly addressed to young people. Some platforms are not exclusively, exclusively created for one or another, but there are um, generic tendencies. Okay, so from what we found, we managed to create six clusters. Uh, based on the examples that we have been provided for. Of course, there is not one standard and that probably should be the overall conclusion for the entire study. There is not one standard that is used by all countries, even when there are similar platforms. And probably it's worth to say that we are still in an um, experimenting stage where uh, tools are being created based on local needs or on hearsay sometimes. So on everything that someone feels there is a need or would like to have, and they are missing regardless of what is already available or not. So one of the platforms or the main categories we have identified are the educational and professional guidance platforms. They mostly support the educational path of young people gaining ICT skills, uh, self-assessing their skills, knowledge, opportunities to apply for jobs, uh, or engage in gamified activities. It is worth to say that they sometimes are connected with both uh, online and offline activities, but these platforms are there. And we have uh, highlighted some examples in the study. A small disclaimer in the study, we'll see um, some specific examples highlighted, but if if you are interested, you can also have a look in the annexes. Over there, you can see uh, more or less all the answers that have been sent through the survey. So it is good to see how people understood these, um, these context, these national context, and how they decide to describe that. Uh, a second category of platforms are related to information and counseling. I suppose they might be familiar to you. Uh, they range from platforms that address emotional well-being, self-esteem. Some of them rights of people, of young people. Either they are dealing with uh, young refugees, uh, young refugees, LGBTQI, uh, or other uh, other issues. It really depends on the country where they are implemented as countries, for example, such as Sweden might be open and might address uh, different issues and topics. A third category would be health. Uh, in the health category, we have found the different types of platforms ranging from those dealing with um, emotional crisis of young people, depression, uh, but also supporting young people with substance abuse, uh, offering advice on the sexual activity. And to be honest, some of them include services like 24-7 uh, support online where young people can reach out sometimes to the specialized council, sometimes to chatbots. So it is important to say that various forms have been um, put in place. The fourth category refers to uh, platforms that in our study were particularly important as they were targeting marginalized young people uh, because they were trying to make life easier for young people in uh, various categories. As I also all have seen in your questions, we might have looked at the young people with the marginalized background in a more generic perspective. We have looked to identify different concrete practices. I think it was about supporting young people with the visual impairments or um, people that have um, disabilities uh, such as walking and other more physical ones. So these platforms exist there. They are very much related to accessibility and facilitation. Uh, online safety probably it would be fair to say it's one of the most popular uh, type of platforms we could have identified as many of them deal with uh, cyberbullying, illegal content, harmful, some of them hate speech, probably not that many, but 
uh, with the Sporto Council of Europe as well and the Advisory Council, this topic has increased. There are uh, many helplines, again, similar to other health platforms. They offer tailored support, reporting mechanisms to young people, some of them 24 7. This is important to say that these kind of platforms sometimes are not necessarily or exclusively dedicated to young people, but to parents, teachers, and other grown ups that interact with the young people as well. And the last one is linked to dialogue and consultation. And I think we have seen most of these examples related to the EU uh, structured dialogue. And Dan might give us a more detailed overview of how this happens uh, as, uh, in the structured dialogue. Youth councils and other youth organizations with national working groups have designed special platforms to outreach and consult more young people. OK, moving on. Uh, platforms mainly addressed to young people. Well, there are definitely uh, these kind of uh, platforms. Uh, sorry, to youth workers. Uh, there are definitely these kind of platforms. They might not be so obvious. Uh, some of them are uh, probably more focused on teachers. It really also depends. We haven't found so many well-defined platforms, but there are. They can be somehow generic or. A multi purpose, if we want. Uh, they do have a purpose of complementing face to face work. So, we didn't really find platforms that would offer services exclusively online, but in a way complement what's happening in uh, other contexts. They are designed to improve the, the ICT skills. So, probably the platforms that we'll identify are related to educational purposes learning something, earning some form of certification, whether it's recognized or not at the national level. Uh, they are used as um, uh, platforms to share experience, materials, and resources, so some sort of repositories, but also opportunities to, to interact between different categories. Again, it can be teachers or youth workers. And last, uh, other platforms that support uh, teachers, educators, youth workers to active, actively engage in online safety and basically guide young people in this, in this process. So these were the examples. And then we have this third category that we put here. And here are the, um, the platforms that we have seen in place and are quite interesting. Uh, they are not necessarily dedicated to young people, but might be about young people or might use youth workers to, to implement them. On the one side, we had online registries, which is connected with the youth guarantee monitoring tools, for example, where um, public institutions, in some cases, local or central ones, um, register young people based on the education, uh, on the opportunities they have access to, income level. Either they are dropouts, the youth guarantee in particular was looking at young people in not uh, employment, education, or training so-called needs. Others are related to participatory budgeting platform. <coughs> uh, they are probably not that common, but where such a mechanism exists, because it has to be underlined, uh, first of all, such mechanisms has to exist at the local level in most cases, uh, they have created uh, online platforms for that as well. And AI-powered chatbots, well, we haven't found that many examples. We have heard more about them probably after the crisis. Um, but in Austria, uh, the youth services were actually using them and implementing them by the time we already had uh, this study created. Okay, moving on. Uh, adding to the digital tools and platforms, we looked at what educational practices we have. Uh, again, we looked at the programs and the opportunities, both for young people and youth workers. Digital education is a rather sensitive topic in a way and probably the, the effects of it or lack of it we can see mostly today. So when looking at digital skills and educational programs it is fair to say there is no generalized practice. So there is no practice in the way we do it. There is no practice in the way we aim to develop them. Either it's about basic skills or more advanced um, digital skills such as programming or more advanced functions of using the digital world. Uh, what we have discovered are more or less five directions. And one is uh, mostly those that we have identified are initiated or even led by NGOs, youth centers or services or even private entities. So that can be 
uh, companies or other um, foundations that do it for profit when they organize it. But we also have governments and educational institutions that usually deal with the formal part of the education and they do deliver courses on basic ICT skills. For example, in Sweden, um, at primary school, at least digital skills were compulsory. So it was in the responsibility uh, of the government to deliver it. In terms of funding, there is not one way of doing it, but we have noticed that uh, EU funding has been used quite generously in funding this, but also private. And also this might raise the question that we might have dealt with it in, uh, in a different study. And that is um, the most advanced courses on digital skills, such as programming, coding, um, in many cases, they require um, a fee, which might not make them that accessible for all young people. And uh, last, uh, some of the last points, most of the trains are delivered in face-to-face -face formats. So if, even if it's about digital skills, we haven't really discovered so far um, platforms that would go from beginning to the end to teach you or to support in developing a digital skill but they do offer complementary online materials. So the digital world is about learning new things, but still in face-to-face -face formats. And wherever they exist, especially in the countries that offer more opportunities, there are also some um, educational opportunities for advancing and understanding what is online safety and creativity. And by creativity, we have seen examples such as maker spaces where young people are encouraged to use their digital skills and creativity to develop new new things okay that would be on the young people side from the youth workers and educators side we looked at um, three dimensions if you can say so on the one hand are the uh, european efforts it is worth to say and in the first part of the study that dina introduced you will see the different frameworks that exist at the European level developed by EU institutions. We are not referring to them, but to other resources that have been created. If the, maybe not all the EU resources define that work. digital youth work in itself, but digital competencies, competencies for educator, competencies for organizations. Uh, so one of the tools is this one, the policy recommendations of developing digital youth work which was done by a working group commissioned by the European Union. So it kind of um, refines the competence defined in the EU, uh, Digicom, Digicom, Digital Competence Framework, and adds more to the youth work dimension. Then we have other two tools developed by, in this case, by NGOs, European NGOs, European Guideline for Digital Youth Work, and then developing online youth information trainings. So these are resources that you can see they also come with uh, practical examples. In terms of national frameworks, we chose one of the very few examples we have received, and that is the Ireland's practice, as they have two national frameworks that particularly address de the development of skills on a general level, but also in particular the school level. And in terms of national uh, topics, well, where we have seen the, there is more a variety of practices and not a very particular standard that can we can put in just a single category, but the diversity of topics that they approach. Cyberbullying is one of most popular, as we said, then social engineering, understanding what is the impact of social media safety online. Okay, since the time is moving very fast, I'll try to go fast to be through opportunities, risk and implications of digitalization. But first, I will have a short look at what you have chose before uh, the Menti question. So that was the question, digitalization has changed youth work. And so far I think we have a winner and that is digitalization is just another dimension of youth work, closely followed, not yet, maybe after the pandemic. And one of the least voted, if fully implemented digitalization will solve the problems of previous youth work practices, okay. Let's see, let's see what we did discover in a way related to, to these questions. 
also we looked at how young people and youth uh, work deals with it in terms of opportunities and risks there are both and probably it's worth to say uh, many of them start from the digital skills as they are both an enabler but when they don't exist they actually increase the gap and probably something we can measure about is will happen after the the crisis in terms of opportunities we looked how they influence health and well-being as they do support the bypass of contacting professionals so technology might facilitate this dialogue and it does so uh, it might destigmatize uh, uh, spaces and does that as well by offering resources so it's a way of saying that uh, social media it, it can be a tool a beneficial one for young people in particular and it might help with uh, their mental health as well communication and information i guess that goes without saying i'll not insist too much on this topic participation and probably participation should be dealt with a bit more in the future as there are many tools that are available probably there should be a way to analyze better which one of them are most popular which one of them are most effective but the diversity of these platforms exists definitely it's there it's part of our reality either we use the social media or a specific government platforms and creativity and self-expression, we should not really neglect this power of technology and digital tools. Blogging and blogging are the tools that young people use today. Either it's the YouTube channel or the TikTok platform, but they are using it and it's enabling them. But also platforms such as Scratch and Codework actually supports their development of advanced digital skills, transforming them in future professionals in technology. And from the risk side, well, there are risks and we are aware of that. It's important not to let ourselves overwhelmed of them, but not ignoring them either. Cyberbullying, yeah, harmful online content, information bubbles and critical thinking, privacy and data protection. These are the four main categories. Cyberbullying is probably, as highlighted several times, one of the most widespread phenomenon, but also the content developed and um, accessed by young people online can create uh, long-term traumas and uh, personality problems. The information bubbles, well, do come in a world when we talk a lot about fake news and disinformation. So critical thinking, it is a sensitive issue we have to touch upon. Privacy and data protection. This is probably the newest and somehow cool, but yet not fully understood challenge that we deal with as more technologies actually access data and we might need as youth workers and practitioners to be better prepared to protect it but also to support young people in understanding how to protect it by themselves and moving on for the youth work that will be the thing to to see exactly how it happens but from what we have studied and we have seen the path from youth work to digital youth work, it's important to be understood as digital youth work does not represent a youth work method in itself, as it can be included in any type of youth work. And this is something um, Finland has been developed as a concept very well, but also the EU recommendation on smart youth work has underlined that digital media can be a tool, activity, content, but it still remains close to the basic ethics and a value of classic old fashioned youth work. Still, in, on the opposite side or on the beneficial side, it does help to engage young people more effectively and productively than before it could. And we highlight that part, reach more young people, but it really depends on the means, the possibility, the accessibility and the price. And last but not least, AI power tool, this magic word, artificial intelligence do or could have beneficial use for young people to reach to more young people, uh, to offer tailored content, tailored support, yet it is a matter of seeing how much skill and expertise is in the youth sector or how much expertise the youth sector has available in actually developing AI power tools. And last but not least, before passing the floor to our colleague, Adina, and to other panelists, here is the question and the second one and the last one. And I will leave this open, um, maybe closer to the end. What is staying with you 
after hearing all this, after um, everything that we will discuss after this, when thinking about social inclusion, digitalization, and youth. Choose your three favorite words that will stay with you after this, so we can have uh, a feedback and input from all of you. Thank you so much. Lana, you have the floor. Thank you, Veronica. If uh, you can just stop uh, the screen sharing. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much. This will also allow all our participants and us to see uh, to see the chat uh, and the questions. Uh, we have also uh, noted a number of questions uh, coming from your side, both to the chat uh, with all the attendees, but also uh, directed only to the panelists. Um, there were some technical questions uh, to start off with regarding the availability of the presentation and the videos and whether it is going to be uh, available afterwards. Uh, so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we will have the recording uh, of this uh, presentation on our YouTube and on our Facebook uh, channel. And uh, also to tie in with some of the questions, uh, our work on social inclusion, digitalization and young people is not only limited to this study, uh, but uh, we have at the same time also worked on the youth knowledge book. And while the study is based on uh, not only the desk review, but also the questionnaires that we have received uh, uh, during last summer, uh, but the knowledge book on the other hand uh, presents a bit more of an insight into specific practices. Uh, and the chapters uh, which we have in the knowledge book uh, will look at uh, some of the examples that some of you have already mentioned in the chat uh, when it comes to working with young refugees, uh, for example, or working with young people people uh, who have uh, uh, visual disabilities, uh, visual impairments. Um, so the knowledge book, uh, which is coming up, uh, it is in the final editing phase, uh, will be able to give some more insights into specific examples and specific uh, groups of young people and how digitalization affects their lives. Uh, I would like to go uh, into the questions uh, right away, as uh, I know that, some, that we are uh, short on time. Uh, and one of the first questions uh, related to the study was about uh, the minority groups and how these have been selected, or uh, how the groups of young people we are, uh, we are addressing the study have been identified. And to start off with, uh, firstly, we had the steering group. Uh, which was uh, one of the bodies basically that influenced uh, how the study will be shaped and developed. And uh, the steering group identified different groups of young people uh, which uh, should be included and considered within the study. Uh, but then as it progressed as well, uh, it got a little bit more narrow. And I would like to invite Dan to maybe discuss the question of how the, the groups are selected, but then also to reflect on the question of uh, the age uh, age groups of people that uh, of young people that are included. Yeah, those, those are really good questions, and I think that the thing to stress is we've not necessarily done this study uh, kind of on specific groups of young people, and there isn't a list of people we consider to be marginalised and excluded groups or, or minority groups, and a list that we don't. Um, the real point of this study was to talk about inclusion in the way that. Uh, you can talk about the general inclusion of young people as a whole group. So how do digital tools help include young people in the labor market? But we wanted to look at um, social inclusion from the dimension where there are different in groups, um, sort of subgroups of young people, if you will. So young people with disabilities, young people, uh, young refugees, these, these kind of groups who are affected differently by digitalization. We didn't produce a definitive list of, of who is considered in that and who isn't because because what we're really doing is exploring the the policies and the practices that um, people uh, in youth policy and youth practice are doing rather than trying to interview directly young people um, so similarly that applies with the age ranges we didn't specify a particular age range it's not really necessary to do that um, but we worked with the general concept that the probably the council of europe has in the youth sector that you're, you're talking something around 13 to 30, maybe 35, this kind of thing. Um, I think where your question on um, majority, uh, I'm sorry, majority and minority groups comes from specifically is one of the pieces of data we used was the youth dialogue data. And that's a survey of 28,000 young people from across Europe. And that divides up, uh, it tracks um, various 
categories or groups of young people and those are uh, ethnic minority background, disability, sexuality, gender uh, and religious minority backgrounds. So you can make a cluster of people who are the minority groups within that and look for general trends between them. There's definitely differences within those groups and the knowledge book really flags that sort of thing up. So we have a chapter on the experiences of LGBT young people, uh, the experiences of young refugees, um, the experiences of blind young people. Um, but when you actually look at the, the all kind of uh, anything that fits into that kind of youth dialogue categories of groups and majority and minority groups as a whole, you can still see differences compared to the overall population. So I hope that answers that question very quickly. Okay, uh, thank you, Dan. And I would like to invite uh, Dunya, who is also one of the co-authors, to, uh, to add on to that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm Dunja Potocnik, youth researcher from Croatia and a member of the pool of the European youth researchers. I would like to add only two points. Uh, first one is actually considering the overall EU level. Uh, there is a strong need to review the EU dashboard on social inclusion and to add uh, additional indicators on digitalization because at this moment, uh, social inclusion and digitalization or online participation are completely separated in the EU dashboard. And we need to do this in order to have some, at least some kind of immediate uh, basis for uh, evidence-based policy. Uh, the second point is something that is uh, very important and that is very often being neglected. And it is the need to involve young people as co-creators and uh, partners in development and reinventing of the policies, platforms, tools, and approaches when it comes to social inclusion and digital media. And of course, in evaluation of all these components, because at this moment, if uh, uh, some approaches or tools for uh, digital social inclusion are not being invented at the level of the um, uh, grassroots organizations or youth activists, young people are very often being excluded. And it is a practice that should be abolished. That's it, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dunja. We have also uh, received an addition from Slaja, who is uh, working on the EU youth indicators, and she's also, also a member of a pool of European youth researchers uh, regarding the, the revisions of the dashboard. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask Slaja to please uh, type in, uh, and I will, uh, I will read it up uh, then uh, for, for all the participants. Um, then also we had some questions uh, regarding the uh, digital youth work uh, and basically how uh, how this has been addressed uh, within the study and also some practice sharing from uh, from the participants from the attendees in terms of how they have created Dana has shared how they have actually created the framework uh, on how to use uh, digital tools uh, within the context of social inclusion. Okay, uh, then uh, as we are nearing the end of our time, I would like to raise uh, just one of the points uh, regarding uh, artificial intelligence, which was asked by uh, Emilia uh, from the Advisory Council uh, on Youth uh, from the Council of Europe. Uh, and this relates to the question of how uh, we have included artificial artificial intelligence within the study, but is it not explicitly uh, perhaps uh, analyzed uh, within the practices. And this is uh, because of the questionnaires uh, that we have, uh, the responses to the questionnaires we have received. However, artificial intelligence uh, as a subfield, uh, let's say, of uh, digitalization uh, has been analyzed and it is also included uh, within the knowledge book. We have a chapter on how artificial intelligence and algorithms actually can contribute to increasing inequalities. Uh, and uh, also we will be talking a little bit more about this on the 12th of May uh, within the upcoming webinar uh, with uh, Dan McKillen and Ron Salaj who will be exploring uh, how artificial intelligence actually impacts on different inequalities and gaps uh, within the society and how the um, digital divide uh, actually also replicates uh, the divisions uh, within or the inequalities within society. Uh, and this also brings me to uh, additional question uh, from Emilia, uh, which is about uh, 
the explanation of what we mean by uh, the how uh, digital divide actually creates a div voice divide. Uh, and uh, I think this was actually the underlining, uh, let's say the, the base of our study, the underlying question, uh, whether actually uh, the digital tools can help uh, young people who do not necessarily have the opportunities to participate within society on equal footing, uh, or whether it actually uh, inhibits the opportunities to participation and whether it actually replicates the gaps that we are seeing uh, in the society. And as you have seen from the study, we do not uh, have the actual tools and platforms that we have not been able to find them from the questionnaires that are implicitly including uh, young people uh, from disadvantaged social backgrounds. Uh, and I can see also that uh, Slaja has uh, will be following up on the questions of indicators uh, offline. Uh, so thank you for that. And I'm sorry that uh, we haven't been able to take uh, all the questions uh, due to the time it was uh, it was not possible. Uh, but I would like to go back to our Mentimeter uh, from uh, the start uh, of the of the webinar. And to see what are your thoughts. Uh, so does digitalization facilitate social inclusion uh, and basically uh, so uh, it is more or less uh, equal. Uh, nine, uh, nine of you uh, actually think that uh, digitalization does create more opportunities for all. Um, eight uh, consider that digitalization uh, can actually create more inequalities. Uh, and five say, uh, I'm here to find out. Uh, none of uh, the attendees are in the wrong Zoom, which is uh, great news. Or perhaps you realize that you were, but still decided to stick around to find out uh, more. Okay, uh, just uh, one more thing uh, before we close. I would like to thank uh, all the authors uh, of the study for their work uh, throughout the last year. Uh, and also to emphasize that the study is available uh, already on our website. Uh, and uh, we will also be sharing uh, in the coming days a one page uh, illustration or infographic summarizing all the findings of the study. Uh, so it will also be available in a user friendly format for those of you who would like to see uh, just some of the main uh, highlights uh, from uh, almost 100 pages uh, that are on our website now. Uh, please do feel free to add uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the examples uh, from your work uh, in the chat. Uh, we would love to hear hear more from you, and also uh, do feel free to continue the discussion uh, on our Facebook. And we thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for the time, and we hope to see you on our next webinar, then on the 12th of May, talking about the impact of artificial intelligence on social inclusion of young people. Thank you and see you again next time.